Hi, everyone. It's Rob, and thanks for listening in today. I greatly appreciate your time. As always, I want to express my deep gratitude to each and every one of you for your support. And of course, gratitude to my friends, Ashish and Jimpa, and as well as the team here at Image One for helping to make Leading with Genuine Care a real difference maker in this world. Now, if you haven't added your name to our email list, I would love it if you would. You can go to donothingbook.com. And if you're inspired, please share the podcast with your friends, your coworkers, and people within your network. Okay, so today, my guest is Dr. Karma Punso. Now, Karma's work is in Bhutan, and it's fascinating because within the last 20 years, Bhutan changed from an absolute monarchy to a constitutional monarchy. Get this, until 1999, Bhutan actually had a ban on television and the internet. Essentially, they were one of the last countries in the world to introduce television. Now, a new constitution was presented early in 2005, and in 07, the first national parliamentary elections were held. In 08, the 28-year-old son of the king, Jingmi Kesar Namjil Wanchuk, was appointed the new king of Bhutan and remains in that role today. Though Bhutan's economy is one of the world's smallest, it has grown rapidly in recent years. 8% in 2005, 14% in 06, and in 07, the second fastest growing economy in the world at 22.4%. Now, a lot of this was due to the commissioning of a gigantic Tala hydroelectric power station. Another point of interest about Bhutan is the focus they put on their society's happiness, led by the current king and using what they call the gross national happiness metric. This metric was later applied to businesses, which I learned about from Dr. Havin To, a past guest on the podcast. Now he led Bhutan's rollout of gross national happiness and now consults businesses among others on doing the same. We utilize components of the gross national happiness metric at my company, Image One, through an annual happiness survey. Okay, now back to Karma. He is a trained monk in Bhutan and India, received a Master of Science in Teaching and a PhD in Oriental Studies at Balliol College at the University of Oxford. He was a researcher at the French National Center for Scientific Research in Paris and a Spalding Fellow for the Comparative Religion at Cambridge University. Karma is founder and president of the Loden Foundation in Bhutan, which is dedicated to fostering an enlightened and happy society through promotion of social entrepreneurship, education, and Bhutan's culture and tradition. He's also the director of the Shurjan Agency, a nonprofit organization that focuses on the documentation and study of Bhutan's written heritages and oral traditions. Karma is also the author of the books, History of Bhutan and the Autobiography of Ten Tam Pama Lingpa. Okay, I know you're going to enjoy my chat with Dr. Karma Punso. Karma, welcome to the Leading with Genuine Care podcast, live from Bhutan. I am so grateful that you've joined me. Thank you, Rob. It's a pleasure to be with you. Now, as we record this, it's 8 p.m. in the evening, your time. It is 10 a.m. on the Eastern uh, Standard Time here in the United States. So I greatly appreciate you doing this sort of on the later side of your evening. I think it's a good timing. It's your morning, my evening. Yes. Uh, it's very difficult to get a mutually acceptable time in the, uh, <laughs> the rest of the day. <laughs> yes. So... I was reading something this morning and you, I thought about you and I thought about Bhutan a bit. And uh, it was something that the Dalai Lama had written, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. And I wanted to read it to you and just maybe um, I would like to hear your thoughts about this statement he made. And, and I quote, the levels of understanding and respect found in traditional societies are often dictated by survival conditions, and contentment also depends on temporary ignorance of other possible ways of life. 
ask Tibetan nomads if they would prefer to be better protected from the winter cold, if they would like stoves that did not blacken the inside of their tents, if they would like to be better cared for when they are ill, or if they would be interested to see what is happening on the other side of the world by means of television. I know exactly what they would answer, end quote. So, Karma, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on, the, on His Holiness's uh, statement. Well, His Holiness, uh, under whom I've also studied quite a bit, is uh, perhaps one of the most inspirational human beings alive. And uh, he has this unusual traditional Buddhist education, but also this amazingly progressive. So what I get from his is that... Uh, while it's important that we um, you know, appreciate traditional life, we have to also understand that people sometimes want better lives. So be it in a very rural nomadic condition or nomadic uh, situation in Tibet or a rural farming community here in Bhutan, people are constantly looking for better living standards. People don't normally like hardships and especially when they find or when they're exposed to um, different, better ways of living, then we can't help their <laughs> uh, slight greed to <laughs> also improve themselves. So I suppose the question he was asking uh, or wanted us to ask the nomads and the answer that we have to ad- anticipate would be, yes, the nomads would want to mm. uh, have their tents heated or a smokeless stove or maybe television to see um, the rest of the world. I read the, uh, recently I looked up in preparation for our chat, the term karma, and I Mm. wanted to get the dictionary's exact definition. What I read was quote, the sum of a person's actions in this and previous states of existence viewed as deciding their fate in future existences, end quote. Now, personally, I think about the term karma frequently. That said, it is not my name. It's your name. Do you think (laughs) about the term karma in a different way because it is your name? I do, a little bit. Um, What you just shared is a more theoretical, metaphysical definition of karma in the religious systems. So it's not just a Buddhist concept. It's shared by other religions also originating in India. But uh, one other way of looking at karma is also a more pragmatic understanding of it as actions. So uh, you can think of it as the sum total of uh, an individual's actions done in this life and the previous lifetimes that then determine the person's future. But it could also be the individual action that we perform or that we engage in right now or yesterday, like uh, trampling on an insect or shouting at somebody who has annoyed you, those individual actions are karma. And um, it's important, I think, that we get these individual actions right for the sum total to be right. (laughs) So whenever I think of my name, I always say, my name is karma punso. The second part is an adjective which means marvelous or auspicious. Mm. So I say, my actions ought to be righteous and wholesome if I go by my name. (laughs) So it's a good reminder to always engage in right action, I would say. (laughs) Although I don't always manage to do that. (laughs) It's a life's journey. And I'm wondering for those in leadership positions and those that want to go about their lives and lead with genuine care, what is something that they can do to keep that at the forefront of their mind? I suppose as a leader, and I have been being a leader in some modest way myself, I consider it very, very important to engage in the exemplary actions. So my karma will have to be something that other people can look up to if I um, wish to be a good leader. So I think it's very important that we, um, as leaders, engage in good actions. 
Now, when we talk about actions, especially in Buddhism, one important point, and a unique one actually, that the Buddhist system teaches is, your thoughts are the most important actions that you perform or you commit. So your state of the mind, the intention you have, the volition you have is the most important, the most fundamental karma. And I think leaders really have to be very, very clear about having good intentions, about having benevolent, altruistic intentions to help others. Uh, I would say that would be very, very important, uh, very essential quality of a leader. Now, I want to speak a little bit about your background. I've read that when you were applying to Oxford University, there was someone who was going to be a reference for you, and this person had agreed to do it, but asked you to write your own reference, and then this person would sign, uh, sign off on it or sign their name to it. And going about this exercise, my understanding is you found this to be quite challenging. This idea that you would have to, quote unquote, sell yourself, which you didn't understand and didn't align with your teachings. <laughs> I'm curious, how did you overcome the feeling and what did you learn from this? Amazing, Rob, that you found this small <laughs> anecdote about my life. I very clearly remember that serious dilemma or difficult situation I was in. I remember when I was uh, applying to Oxford, I met a, a Taiwanese friend. I was telling him, I was act actually asking him what I should write in a reference letter or what would be in a reference letter. And he was saying, oh, you have to sell yourself. And I didn't quite get that phrase at that time. I didn't know what he meant by sell yourself. <laughs> but uh, I then later on learned that the reference letter will really have to be saying good things about you. And when I approached my immediate uh, master to write one for me, he said, uh, because he didn't, of course, have English. So he said, you write one and bring it to me. And that was the most difficult thing, uh, difficult task I faced, because if I write something sort of uh, good about myself, glorifying myself, what would I look like in the eyes of my teacher? <laughs> <laughs> if I was so modest and sort of so humble and tried to sort of self-deprecate myself, then the whole purpose of the recommendation letter would be lost. <laughs> so I had a tough time, but then I managed to make it more objective, uh, sort of by mentioning, say, the prizes I've won or the scores I've had in my exams and not necessarily using many adjectives. So when I presented that to him, he found it acceptable. Uh, so I managed to get away. <laughs> and one good lesson I learned is also now as a scholar and an academic, I end up writing references for lots of people. And I always find it very important to just state the facts, not really bring the evidence and the stories from people's um, life, not just give a flowery account that doesn't really touch on the real achievements, but just put together the facts and the achievements and they will speak for themselves without you having to be judgmental or use too many adjectives. So. Mm -hmm. These days, I always tell people when you write references, always go with the concrete <laughs> yes. facts and figures. So, you know, I was, as I was reading a little bit more about your background, I learned that you, upon leaving Bhutan, had the opportunity to experience more of the world than maybe most uh, other Bhutanese people. You would attended Oxford and you lived in the UK for, I think, 14 years and then in India for 10 years. And what I'm curious about is what did you learn about those experiences and why did you return to Bhutan and how do you use these experiences that you gained to better your community? Uh, very, very fortunate to have had uh, this very diverse educational training and uh, exposure I think, uh, if not unique, it was a very rare experience. Even within the Buddhist system, I started by joining the uh, Drupakaju order here in Bhutan, 
as a monk. And then I went to India and got training in the Gelugpa tradition, the Dalai Lama's school, education in the Nyingma tradition, the ancient school. So even for my Buddhist education, it was quite diverse. And I remember leaving Bhutan at the age of 17 with 800 rupees in my pocket to pursue Buddhist education. And that led me to a fantastic rigorous monastic education with so many Tibetan masters to whom I am deeply grateful. And then uh, in 1997, after finishing my monastic training and teaching in the monastery for a short while, I really wanted to learn the Western academic methodology of studying religions and also explore Western world uh, in general. So I applied to Oxford and I was lucky to again get a scholarship in spite of the, the hurdles I had of even uh, putting together a CV and getting references. But I was uh, quite lucky to again get both admission and a partial scholarship. So. I ended up in Oxford to, to do a Sanskrit and classical Indian religions uh, program for my master's, then went on to do a PhD on the philosophy of emptiness. And when I look back you know, at those trainings, I think the traditional monastic training helped me look at my own spiritual heritage in a, uh, with a local perspective. And then going through this academic training really has helped me look at it in a, from a different point of view. And these two different perspectives I today combine in my scholarly works. So for instance, when I write about the history of Bhutan, I present both the traditional view of things as well as the modern historiographical view of things, because our world is quite rich in terms of people's perspectives and diverse uh, viewpoints. So. I'm quite uh, happy that I can explore these two different ways. And uh, also uh, having lived and having sort of brought up through a rigorous traditional training here has, has given me a very good grounding in the local cultures and languages. Then the exposure in the West, so initially in the UK for 14 years or so, sometime in France and also a little short time in the US, they have given me very good understanding of the Western world. So today I try to be a good uh, translator of, the, uh, of these different worlds to each other. When I go back home, I try to communicate to the monks and the villagers what modernity is about, what the Western world faces today as uh, prospects, as challenges. I explain to them the general economic situation of the world, the politics of the world. Mm. And the same way, I also transmit uh, Buddhist values and Buddhist history to the outside world. So my role, I would say, is really being that go-between. And it's my educational exposure that has really given me that strength. Mm. You, you mentioned that you did your PhD in emptiness. And I'm wondering for an ordinary person, say like myself, what can I learn from your studies and from your PhD that I could apply to my, my life? So the philosophy of emptiness is the most important philosophical concept in Mahayana Buddhism and uh, also very, very important to other Buddhist traditions. And my thesis was more on the debates on the interpretation of emptiness among different scholars and schools. But if I put to you in very simple forms what emptiness is about, emptiness is really about sort of seeing things as interdependent. You know, when you look at me, for instance, this karma that you uh, are right now talking to is actually just a name given to a cluster of his psychosomatic constituents. There's no real karma. And the most important message that I should get from that is 
I shouldn't be too obsessed with myself. <laughs> There's no real me. There's no real karma to be grasping, to be clinging on to. Uh, so it really should help me relax a bit, let go of that fixation and that stress and obsession. So apply that to everything else in existence. So you think of a car. A car is a name we give to this compilation of different parts in a certain structure performing a specific function but there's no real car and if you understand that illusory nature of the car then one would be able to deal with the car in a more relaxed manner with less attachment with less fixation and obsession so that's the most important message coming from emptiness that reality is very complex and interconnected we should not sort of have a fixation or a singular grasping at anything. If we were to see things objectively as they are in their natural state, we have to accept them as a fluid, interdependent, interconnected experience. Of course. And there's a phrase that comes to mind. And I wonder, does it fall in the same sort of area as emptiness? And uh, the phrase is, I am nothing, yet I am everything. Does that sort of speak to emptiness in the way that you're describing it, or is it that something different? Yes, this is exactly the point of emptiness. If you really look for Rob, there's no Rob to be found. But yet, Rob is present and is connected to everything else around Rob and everything else in the universe. So uh, you have to see the absence of an absolute sort of hypostatic self-existence, which then manifests in this fantastic, beautiful, myriad presence of phenomena. So it's the synergy or the union of the absence and the presence. In Buddhism, it's often said, emptiness and appearance. I, it, it gets me thinking a bit about the work that you do and, and how in some of the work that many of the listeners do, you know, you are founder and president of the Loden Foundation uh, based in Bhutan. And uh, you have a social entrepreneurship program there. And what I'm curious about first is for those in leadership positions, those that want to lead with genuine care just within their lives, how can they use this idea of emptiness or nothingness as a practical way of thinking as they make their way through their interactions and the decisions that need, they need to make and, and maybe even the quote unquote dramas that, that you know, uh, entail uh, many of our lives? I, I'd love to hear your feedback on that. I think there are many levels uh, on which emptiness can be practiced and applied to our daily life. Uh, some of them will be definitely very esoteric, advanced ways to practice emptiness. But I think in positions of leadership in a business or in a sort of normal mundane organization, so as I said earlier, emptiness is the other side of the coin of interdependence, of interconnectedness. So the understanding of interconnectedness should really help us um, see how the company and of course the community at large, and even greater than that, the whole world is uh, totally interdependent and linked to each other. So this holistic experience uh, understanding of emptiness and interconnectedness should really make the leaders make decisions that um, are that have a much wider uh, impact mm. to be mindful of the repercussions and uh, implications of the business decisions you make in a company mm. now on a slightly higher level, if one understands the nature of emptiness and interconnectivity, then one thing you see is also how one's 
itself is actually so caught up in seeing the world is real and then getting a lot of stress and suffering because of that. So when somebody say uh, swears at you or says something rude to you, because we hold on to that word and sound is real, we get really hurt. But if we can actually sort of sit back and then mindfully think about that word and the sound and see its empty nature, you wouldn't be as upset or hurt as when you see the sound as a real thing. And the same thing can apply to many behaviors and actions which annoy us, which in an organization, one ought to, as a leader, have this very accommodating, broad heart and mind, be very tolerant of and be able to cope with so many things. And I think it will really help to see the emptiness of some of these um, annoying things, mm. be able to keep one's composure. And then you realize that those who don't understand this nature of emptiness or interdependence actually are far worse and they're stuck in this very realistic understanding of things, taking things always too seriously, being too obsessed with things, being too stressed with things. And you then have this intense sense of compassion for them, wishing them also to reach a point where they actually take things life more, uh, take life more easily. So, I think there is a lot of benefit you know, of having emptiness practice in mm. our daily life, especially in leadership positions. Yes. Thank you for that. C can you talk a bit about the work that you do around social entrepreneurship at the Loden Foundation? So the Loden Foundation is something that I started when I was a student at Oxford, uh, because I was good friends with the college porter and porter in Oxbridge colleges are the, the people who are at the gate, both uh, as a security and also a receptionist. Uh, he was an ex-policeman, we became good friends. And he said he couldn't finish school because uh, he grew up or he was a child in wartime England and his family was poor. So he ended up working on a boat and he said, if there's any child who would also miss school education because of uh, uh, economic uh, uh, background, he would like to help. And all he could afford at that time was 50 pounds a year from his salary. So I got that 50 pounds from him. And when I came to Bhutan, I uh, found a girl from a family of uh, eight daughters, uh, which was one and use those 50 pounds to buy uniforms and books. And that inspired other people to join in. And so that's how we ended up forming the Lothian Foundation initially to support poor children in the rural villages and schools in Bhutan. But then as, uh, uh, as uh, time changed in Bhutan, um, more organizations came to do this similar things. So we then uh, focus more on um, new challenges. And one of the new challenges that Bhutan faced in the 21st century was because of very good school enrollment in the last quarter of the 20th century, there were many school and college graduates coming out. And a lot of these young school and college graduates didn't want to go back to the farms um, to work as their parents did. And then in the 20th century, the civil service, the government would take more or less all of the college graduates and give government jobs. But by the beginning of the 21st century, the civil service was also pretty full and uh, young people couldn't find jobs. The private sector was really poor. So youth unemployment became a new problem. And when you have unemployed youth hanging around in the urban centers, you also have then um, other social issues like substance abuse, alcoholism and crime. So we decided that we should uh, uh, help the state address this new challenge of youth unemployment. And that's how we started the 
post school, post college entrepreneurship training. We initially, uh, me and uh, two friends of mine from France and a few others, we carried out these uh, training programs to basically inspire and to educate and empower young people to become entrepreneurs. And at that time, most people didn't even know the word entrepreneurship. So we coined a word called Songrik in Zonka, the national language. And it literally translates as intelligent business. Mm. So we had a program of intelligent business. And uh, in addition to the training, we also gave them uh, seed capital to start businesses. So uh, even today, a lot of the banks here would give business loans only if you have a very good collateral and the interest rates are still quite high, although there are some government funding available now without requiring collateral. 15 years ago, that was not possible. So a lot of the young people who had brilliant ideas, who were determined to become entrepreneurs, they didn't have the opportunity to start a venture. So we gave them interest-free, collateral-free uh, capital. And then once they get the capital, we again had uh, mostly friends of mine from Europe becoming their mentors. We had the office team in Kempu, the capital, go out to the fields to monitor the enterprises. So we started this in 2008. And uh, so far we have uh, trained well over 5,000 young people. We have uh, um, evaluated some 2,000 business proposals and funded 219 projects to this day. Amazing. Could you share a story of one of the companies and, and how they're doing? And, you know, maybe it's... Uh, something we can all learn from, no matter how experienced we are in our leadership positions? Mm. Um, one of the star entrepreneurs, uh, he was also nominated uh, by us for the International Youth uh, Business Competition in London uh, through Prince Charles's Youth Business International. Uh, he came to us in 2010 with a proposal to do uh, waste management. And imagine you know, 20th century, we didn't really have an issue with waste. Of course, some plastic has arrived, but still the quantity was manageable. By the beginning of the new century, we are flooded with plastic. Of course, we are doing a lot better than many of the neighboring countries, but uh, plastic bottle and many other kinds of waste became an issue because people's uh, consumption habits uh, went through the roof. We started importing a lot to, you know, to uh, meet the consumption demands. So a lot of waste that the local Bhutanese are not uh, aware of uh, dealing with. Um, you could say that until the last quarter of the 20th century, all our wastes were biodegradable by default. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, today we have a lot of non-biodegradable waste. And this young man came to us with a proposal that he would like to um, manage waste. And at that time, it was a very simple proposal. He said he would like to buy a tr truck, uh, no, buy a compressor, which will compress the waste uh, so that he can transport the waste back to India at an affordable price. Because if you couldn't compress the plastic sheets and bags and um, uh, packets, um, the transportation cost to take a truckload of pl plastic from Bhutan to India would be quite high. Mm. So we bought him a compressor machine to basically compress the plastic waste. And then he took paper waste as well and uh, sorted them out separately. So he started this waste management company in 2010, and today he is managing the main, uh, he's uh, the main manager of the waste of the capital city. In fact, since then, he has been the main manager of Timpu's waste. 
There are a few others also participating now, but he is still the biggest. Um, last year, when COVID uh, happened, uh, collecting waste from the quarantine centers was highly risky. So he came back to us again, and we had some COVID response funds. So we bought him a truck to collect just the medical waste from the quarantine centers. Mm -hmm. And uh, he and his staff were trained to collect them properly and dispose them safely. So the kind of benefit this entrepreneur brought to the capital city is immeasurable. Uh, of course, financially, it's not such a great uh, business. He is struggling. But still, the kind of environmental and social and uh, health impact his business has on the society here is uh, extraordinary. And then now taking plastic back to India all the time is also very expensive. And especially when you have borders closed because of things like pandemic, it becomes a real, real challenge for him. So a couple of years ago, he decided to process the plastic into uh, poles. And a lot of our villagers, they are today confronted with a human wildlife conflict, as it is called. Basically, a farmer would go out to the farm, cultivate potatoes. And then after they have sown the seeds, they will have to guard the field every night until they dig out the harvest. Because there are wild boars coming at night to um, eat the potatoes. Mm. And that has happened partly because of Bhutan's uh, success in environmental conservation. The forest cover has come much closer to the human settlements today than they were in the middle of the 20th century. So because of this uh, um, of, uh, depredation caused by the, the wildlife, people, the government has been helping people to have electric fencing. And what do you need for electric fencing? You need to, some uh, plastic insulation. <laughs> mm. So traditional Bhutanese had, uh, they always use wooden poles and they would put a little plastic pipe for insulation. But then our waste manager, he came up with this excellent idea. They will make plastic poles out of the plastic waste. And he has been selling those poles to the farmers. Mm. A real win-win situation. <laughs> I love that. These plastic poles will remain much longer than the wooden poles. <laughs> right. I love that. It's resourceful and it's creative and it's practical. I wanted to speak a bit about the culture in Bhutan and how things have changed in recent history. Um, I had read an interesting uh, example that you shared about uh, substance abuse, specifically about alcoholism, and how in smaller communities, this sort of thing can have a natural constraint on people. Uh, if you remember kind of what you were speaking about at that time, I'm wondering if you could kind of share what, what, you, were, um, what, what you were saying. So Bhutan has certainly gone through a lot of changes in the last 60 years or so. And if you compare Bhutan's change to many countries around the world, it is the speed of change that is very unsettling. Now you look at uh, sort of geopolitical or the geographic situation. Until the middle of the 20th century, Bhutan was uh, hardly known to the rest of the world. Even when I was at Oxford, not many people actually knew where Bhutan uh, is. We have been considered as a very isolated place. But then in the last 60 years, we've built roads, the motor roads have come, uh, airlines have come, uh, tourism has picked up. And then since 1999, Bhutan had its uh, first uh, television station, first internet connection. And now most young people are on social media platforms, including Facebook, WeChat, WhatsApp, TikTok. <laughs> so, uh, in 60 years, we have basically covered the um, span of change that other countries, especially I think European countries and North American countries, have gone through in maybe 100, 150, 200 years. I remember electricity being first installed in my village. And I remember also mobile phones actually coming in uh, before the landlines, before fixed lines, that we didn't have to install fixed lines. <laughs> so... 
Uh, the speed of change is very, very fast here. And look at even the economy. Until the middle of the 20th century, Bhutan was a you know, subsistence farming uh, country, but we grew enough for our own consumption and sometimes even some surplus rice, which we exported to Tibet. The only thing Bhutanese had to import was salt. And now we are here in a totally globalized consumerist sort of market economy and importing so much. Our trade balance is really uh, bad, our trade imbalance. And then um, we have also a political shift until uh, 2008, uh, Bhutan was a medieval monarchy. And then we adopted this uh, bicameral parliamentary democracy. Until 1960s, there was not a single urban area in Bhutan. Even the capital was just a big fortress. But today, almost half of the Bhutanese population are living in urban centers, which are totally new. And then culturally speaking, we come from a very um, nature-oriented, mind-centered, pre-Buddhist and Buddhist background. And in the last 60 years or so, we've brought in a new education system and then biomedicine and now globalization. So um, our understanding of our perception of ourselves, our other people, the world has dramatically changed. We are now pretty much a sort of modern secular uh, society. So when you go through such intense rapid change, it's uh, unavoidable that there will be these tensions. And one of the tensions is that people don't really even have this sense of identity. You know, a lot of young Bhutanese are lost between two worlds. Linguistically, a lot of them would have many second languages, but not one language they can call their first language. And especially when you are psychologically so fragmented and vulnerable, then you give in to temptations like substance abuse or alcoholism. And one of the saddest developments of this rapid, tension, uh, rapid change in Bhutan has been the rise of suicide. Uh, suicide unthinkable before 1960s. And now we have quite a lot of young people, particularly young people taking their own lives every year. When you look at these issues, one of the, the reasons why we are uh, going through these problems is because the environment we live in, the human settlement, we, a lot of Bhutanese live in today are totally new. So it's these towns and the cities uh, where we have got this physical infrastructure built, but we don't have the social and cultural support systems to help the people. So alcoholism is a very good example that you brought up. In the villages, like my village, firstly, people traditionally made alcohol from their own cereals. So you don't have an unlimited amount of wheat or buckwheat or maize to make alcohol. So it, there is already that... Uh, resource constraint. And then whatever alcohol you have made, it's homemade, so it's not toxic. You know how uh, bad or good it is. And when a guest comes, it's a, a cultural practice to offer the guest alcohol. Bhutan is a very uh, alcohol drinking society, so there are so many rituals associated with it. So alcohol plays a major role in cultural practices, but still the housewife or the mother would know how much to serve and would also know, especially in a village setting, who is abusing and overdoing. So would give that um, necessary um, sort of warning and uh, necessary advice mm. to stop that person from overdoing, from sort of going over the brink. So there is that closely knit society which helps, you know, peer pressure, family pressure, and uh, social support, which helps contain alcoholism, although alcohol plays a major role. Now, think of a modern urban context. Alcohol mostly comes from factories. These companies who just want to make money. So it's pretty unlimited because the resources are also imported from uh, India and other countries. So there's no real resource constraint at the beginning. And then once they're sort of sold in the bars, the bartender or the, the business person, again, you may know and 
Some may advise you, but most of them, you know, they, there's that anonymity that they will just do the business and not bother to interfere in your <laughs> life. So mm-hmm. that means people also indulge in alcohol much more in these uh, uh, urban centers with their anonymity than they could do in a village. <laughs> and that leads to much more serious abuse of alcohol. A typical case of how I think a society, when it moves from a well-rooted, well-formed uh, sort of community with all the uh, civic culture and shifts to a new environment where that civic culture is not established, then don't have these uh, facilities to give a wholesome of, uh, life or upbringing. For instance, in Timpo, currently there are two libraries that are accessible to the public, but there would be easily over a thousand bars and shops where they sell alcohol. Amazing. So um, it speaks for how how uh, sort of immature or undeveloped our urban civic uh, culture is. Mm-hmm. But fortunately, we have now uh, civil society awareness growing and rising, even in urban centers. So hopefully in a generation or two, we'll be able to change the course. Yes, thank you for that. That was a wonderful education uh, for myself and I know for all those listening. So Karma, I, I want to thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart for taking the time to chat with me today and uh, bring this conversation of leading with genuine care to the forefront. Well, thank you, Rob. It was a wonderful experience to share with you some stories from Bhutan and from my own life. I hope uh, this is of uh, some uh, interest and benefit to the audience. I strongly believe uh, that uh, we live in an era where uh, we have to be uh, socially responsible and engaged. So although I was uh, trained as a monk, I am now a lay Buddhist, more uh, interested in engaging in the society and bringing uh, the blessings of Buddhism in the ordinary lives of people to sort of educate and transform this social civic culture. Because uh, unless you have such a responsible, uh, flourishing society, a lot of things like spirituality, art, and culture cannot really happen. I think a uh, lot of things that we appreciate, beautiful things in life like art, uh, culture, spirituality, needs the strong base of a flourishing society, or a prosperous society. And uh, business leaders certainly have a major role to play in bringing that prosperity to people. So going back to the initial question you posed uh, uh, through the Dalai Lama's passage, I think uh, it's so important for us to bring uh, prosperity and the sense of flourishing to the people, to improve people's ordinary um, standard of life, living. But uh, then we have to seek that without losing the overall sort of goal of life or the meaning of life. Here in Bhutan, we have uh, gross national happiness as that overall long-term direction that we have to pursue. Not that Bhutan is there yet, but it's a direction that we seek. And uh, basic human flourishing and prosperity becomes an indispensable part of that journey. Thank you for sharing that, Karma. For all of our loyal listeners, I greatly appreciate you spending time with Karma and me today. And, and as always, I wish you all much love and gratitude. 